everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is Security Happy Hour. I am Cyber Warrior, and it is another fantastic week. All right, so with me today, I've got Dennis McCarthy and Cody Bernardi. Uh, Cody actually has been doing a whole lot. Uh, I'm in his Discord channel, and this man has... You know what? He can explain it, because he does so much, so much stuff, uh, and has been doing a lot with his career. Um, Dennis, we linked up on LinkedIn, funny enough. Um, right. and it's been interesting because, um, I put out a lot of information, um, on a regular basis as far as like my YouTube videos and trying to connect with people. And, you know, it's nice finally, um, being known for trying to help the community. Cause that's truly what I'm trying to do is help the community and get people out there get their voices heard and things of that nature. Um, yeah. so the fact that that, uh, the one gentleman added me to that group, which introduced me to you is fantastic. And uh, don't mind me if I grimace a little bit today. My shoulder is doing a lot worse than it has in the past. Um, but saying that, let's get it kicked off and let's get started with uh, Dennis. Why don't you do an introduction of kind of where you're coming from and what you're doing and then where you're trying to get to um, so that everybody can kind of get to know why you're here. Absolutely. So um, I am relatively new officially into the uh, security infor uh, information security world. Uh, but it's not my introduction into um, IT. So I just left law enforcement uh, about a month ago to my first job as an information security analyst. Um, and how that all spun to come to here was, is um, while my time in law enforcement, I got to serve in many different capacities, uh, one being specifically as a criminal investigator, which uh, turned me on to digital forensics, uh, cyber crimes, uh, online investigations. Uh, and that kind of started to unroll this um, ball of yarn, if you will, that's brought me to today. Um, I'm about to graduate with my degree in um, cybersecurity, um, obtained several different certifications, gotten some hands-on experience with different internships. Uh, and a lot of that I owe to LinkedIn, meeting people like yourself and being able to network. And that's brought me to where I'm at today uh, as a full-time uh, information security analyst. Uh, again, like I said, about to complete my degree and uh, a little bit personal about me. I served in the United States Marine Corps for five years and a combat tour in Iraq, came home. And that's where I delved into the law enforcement world. But I'm happily married now. Uh, I have a kid of six years old. He's my life. And uh, that's it. Nice. Yeah. I, uh, being a veteran myself, it's it's nice to see people come out and kind of when you when you hear about uh, being a veteran and. Uh, a lot of times they talk about how we're not helped in, in this, that, and the third, which they're not wrong. There are a lot of issues that could be fixed, but I also put a lot of it on us as veterans, right? We, we have to take responsibility for our actions. If you go Absolutely. into the military as infantry and are like, oh, they didn't pre prepare me for my career. Well, what'd you want to do? Because you went in as somebody who shoots people and blows shit up and expected to get out and do something other than shooting people and blowing shit up. So, you know, I kind of look at it as like, you know, we really have to take responsibility. Now, mind you, I understand the way the Navy and the Marine Corps works, and actually even the Army. Actually, it would be Army and Marines. Navy and Air Force tend to do things a little bit better sometimes. But Army and Marines is usually you're, you're an infantryman first, right? You have to know how to, you know, shoot, move, and communicate. Like, that's that's what we have to know how to do. Um, so your, your, your job, your, your MOS actually comes secondary. Um, so it, it, it is kind of combating that, but at the same time, you know, again, even with the things that are missing in the military to support an actual career move on the outside, we still have to put a lot of that on our soldiers and it, and it comes down to some of our senior leadership. They have to be able to do that. So, um, to see you come out doing the college thing, getting that out of the way, uh, moving into security and it and everything else you've been doing is great. And I love having you because, I love this for the new guys because it's the new people that don't get heard, right? right? So you see people like Alyssa um, Miller, who is amazing. I've had her on the show twice, um, you know, but people know her. People know who she is that, you know, she's a well-known person. Shannon Morse, um, another one that does threat wire and has been around for a while. So mm -hmm. people hear, um, hear them on a regular basis. It's getting people like you um, and get your voice heard that we don't get we don't we don't really get the chance to hear what the new people have to say about the field about what they're going through about what they want to know so that's right. kind of why when you were like oh well what do i gotta just be here be here and talk. Right. get your opinion heard <laughs> because 
soft skills or common skills, or I forget what term Alyssa gave it uh, earlier this week, but it's core skills. That's what it was. Um, those are things you need to do is be able to speak, write, communicate, things of that nature. So having you on something like this will definitely help. Um, but totally. saying that, uh, let's move on real quick and then we'll get into further discussion. Cody, why don't you uh, give us the rundown, man? Yeah. So TLDR about me. I, uh, like many in security, I started out in IT. Um, it's actually kind of funny. I started through Craigslist out of all places as a part-time cable monkey at a data center uh, and slowly got on the job training, um, joined the military in 2014 as a 25 November and then switched over to cyber. Um, and I just got out in March of this year. Um, uh, so I was in the reserve. So I was, had a full-time job as well outside of that. So uh, my security experience, I was at Amazon for four and a half years doing vuln management as a consultant at the same time doing uh, pen testing and stuff like that. And, uh, Currently, I have my own uh, company where I do fraud investigate corporate fraud investigations, and uh, soon, hopefully, cross my fingers, land my first uh, government contract doing a uh, threat emulation and vuln management. Um, and then for the full time job, I'm a senior security engineer. Oh, and I guess I, I should probably mention I have a YouTube channel as well. Yes, <laughs> That's kind of a big one there. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, man. It's it's great because a lot of what you do uh, has to do with OSINT, generally speaking, on your YouTube channel. So uh, mm -hmm. I know you were talking earlier about, you know, what do you want to do next? And you were thinking Multigo. I think that's a great idea, honestly, because even when it comes to OSINT, um, there's a lot to learn there. It's a specialization in itself because it's uh, correlating data that not everybody can do, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's sure. how do you put the pieces <clears throat> together? Um so it's it's definitely interesting to to see some of your videos and what you do um because of the way you explain it especially with things like shodan right like mm -hmm. you can go on shodan and find just about everything in the world um but <laughs> but things like maltigo and things like that are stuff i've never used right so for me it's mm -hmm. always been about let's go online or let's use the discover scripts and recon ng and all that stuff um and then try to correlate the data from there so the way you go through and explain things is actually really cool. Um, so it's definitely appreciated for anybody who hasn't seen it. Um, which, by the mm -hmm. way, send uh, I'll put that link to the YouTube channel in my description later on after yeah. I'm done with this. Um, but, Dennis, why don't you give us a heads up, man. With you getting out of college, coming out of the military, what are some of the pain points you're seeing breaking into the field? And whether it's getting known or getting a job or whatever the case may be, what are your pain points that you're seeing right now? Well, you know... Um it's it's kind of a struggle a little bit because I find a lot of people who want to enter this career field have a lot of questions and there's a lot of information out there to to dissolve. And as like you were saying before, and I agree with you to an extent, you have a lot of people who are, you know, ready to to ask questions, but maybe not necessarily do the work to ask the questions. And I think that that's kind of one of those, you know, testability factors of getting people in. So when I first started, one of the things I started doing is asking questions. Anytime I went to an event, anytime I met somebody in the IT world, I didn't care if they were a help desk. I was like, hey, tell me about this. Tell me about what you do. And they're like, dude, you're a weirdo. Why are you asking me all these questions? But the reality is, is I wanted to know. Um, and as I grew and started getting into more, like I said, the digital forensics background, I found myself uh, understanding different traits like uh, like OSINT, prime example. You know, That's a skill set that not everybody understands, more or less, or do they ever try to use? So. Um, a lot of it was a lot of, you know, uh, uh, shoot names, see where I can come up with. But I find that it, breaking into this, we always talk about that there doesn't seem to be a lot of help. Um, I think there is help. I just don't think it's always guided to the right people, people who uh, have zero background, people who have military background, people who have maybe uh, helped us background wanting to go to the security end. I see a lot of questions in groups. Uh, and I have a lot of Marines that I mentor, different guys that I talk to who want to enter the cyber world, especially now that they've seen me make the switch, but they're like, well, where do I start? Well, where do you start? Because so many different answers get thrown at them. And I don't want it to be a, I don't think it needs to be a, a hand me out, if you will, for getting, getting people into to cybersecurity. But I think it would be um, maybe a focus point, uh, you know, not just people such as yourself and others who are trying to, to bring attention to some of the, the new people coming in, but you know, the, the, um, what I'm trying to say, I guess the best way to say it is, is 
you know, the business aspect of it, you know, we always see these, you know, memes and jokes about, you know, uh, L1 uh, analyst position opens up and they want, they want the guy to have assists, uh, you know, and you're like, come on, really? You know, I obviously can laugh at that now, but there's new people that are like, no, where do I go to get my, what, what do I do to do that? And, you know, it's, so, you know, obviously that there is a huge disconnect from the hiring aspect and the people that do that and the people who are just getting into it. Um, but I think a bigger thing is too, there's a lot of pain and growth for the, you know, once you get in, I feel like everything kind of can take off from there and you can kind of like, you, you know, you're in the game, so go ahead and go play, but it's just getting to the game. You know, there's a lot of uh, build up and anticipation, you know, in the veteran community, there's a lot of uh, unknown because guys want to use their GI bill money to go pay for their, their stuff. And I do, you've been out, you know, um, uh, Cody, I'm sure you've heard it too. Guys get out and they go apply for these random online schools that have, you know, nothing or any kind of relevance to the, uh, uh, to the real world of, of academics, but these guys get taken and they get their money taken and, and from their GI bill because they go to some school that doesn't qualify or takes their money or they get some, you know, not so great degree and they get, you know, screwed. And now here they are, they don't know what to do. And yeah. I think that there's so much mis, you know, excuse me. Um, there's so much confusion uh, at that prior to getting into any form of IT, I guess is what I'm getting at. And I think that that's a, that's a huge focus point as well, or maybe a, where we also need to focus is the people who are getting in. And I know that's kind of a gray area because where do you, where do you set the line at to, to start helping? But I think it needs to be done. And I do like some of the programs that help high school kids, um, middle school kids start introducing them into different, um, you know, uh, uh, subjects like coding and, and different things. I think that will actually, you know, start that thought process a little earlier in life. Yeah, definitely. So that's one of the big things is, is how do you get started? And I hear that asked a lot. Um, right. You know, I've got my mentor, Keetron Evans, who has posted a lot about it. Uh, prior to me switching over to uh, where I posted my new blog at now, um, I did have an article up at one point about how to get into it, how to get started. Um, but I think for me, always one of the big things is, well, what interests you? All right. So right. are you looking for the offensive or defensive? Yeah, the offensive can be sexy and people love seeing all the hacking movies and, and this that, and a third. But maybe it's just not something they can catch on to or they're not really interested in. But that's always like the go to like, oh, uh, go learn this to be a hacker. Like, well, a right. hacker is a <laughs> piss poor term and I hate it. But um you know let's let's be honest it, it, you know do this to be on a red team or do this to be defensive you got to find out where they want to be and so that's usually my first question when somebody comes to me and goes well how do i get into the field because i was different right i came up i've been fixing computers since i was seven i did the help desk sysadmin networking all through the air force and the army i did satcom and, and cyber security and everything else and then I got out and I'd already had the experience and credentials to where it made it easy. So for me, it was easier just because I, I, I went the offensive route, so to speak, as far as, far as training. But mm -hmm. I studied the defensive side. So one thing I learned was to get into the field, find that niche that you want to do. All right? right. Please don't be like me, who has tried very hard to learn everything about everything. Find, <laughs> find that, that part that you enjoy. If it's forensics be great at forensics. If it's um, blue team or analyst work or engineering, work your way up that chain. So understand logs and, and log management and how you can correlate data and things of that nature for that aspect. If you wanna be a thread hunter, then understand how you can search down APTs and the MITRE framework and, and things of that nature. So it's all about finding truly what you wanna do. Unfortunately, um, in order to find what you want to do, if you really don't know much about it, you've got to have a little bit of knowledge of everything. Okay. And that's where people hate it. Base level certifications and, and, and basic cybersecurity knowledge from a, a, a well-known college comes into play. Who mentioned cloud, cloud security? Casey. She would. Uh, Keytron actually mentioned the same thing to me like two or three weeks ago. Cloud security is huge. And actually, so did the company I work for now is <laughs> cloud security. But... Um, you know, you got to get the basics. So yes, cloud. Cloud is becoming huge. So understanding the cloud. Um, Security Plus. I don't care what anybody says. Security Plus is still, still huge. Um, not only is it a breakthrough cert for many in security, it gives you that, that the high level overview. All right. Absolutely. Um, so 
the CEH. Yes, it's a multiple choice cert, or you can get master certified in it or whatever nowadays, and they have some type of lab environment. But either way, it's not this, um, you know, breakthrough, I'm going to hack all the things type of certification. To me, it's a base level offensive security, learn the tools and kind of some of the techniques along the way. But what that does, if you go that route and get, say, CEH, SEC Plus, um, Network Plus is even huge, or Cisco, one of the two, but you get this general overview of all the certifications. And actually, even a new one out is Security Blue Team. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw a little shout out for that. I'm on the academic advisory board. Go ahead and take it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but if you get this general overview of all these things, then you can find what you really enjoy. And if you're in college for security, they should be teaching you at least one subject in all of them. So you should get a subject in security, get a subject in forensics. Because I know when I was going for my master's, that's what they did. We had a course in digital forensics. We had a course in like firewalls and IDSs and IPSs. I wanted to shoot the instructor because all she said was, well, it depends on how much money you spend. But regardless, you, you have to look at it from the high level and then start narrowing your focus down. So right. if they can get that high level and then narrow down what they really enjoy, it makes it easier. All right. Um, and that's something that a lot of people don't want to do. I've seen a lot of memes out um, where it's like, oh, I got my security plus or IT admin or whatever they do and want to go straight to like bug bounties or being a pen tester. Right. It does not work that way unless for some reason you are really damn good at what you do. Um, you're not going to go from a net plus or a sec plus or, or, or a CEH to pen tester um, with no experience. It's just few, 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 few and far between unless you have connections. So kind of get that understanding. Um, I mean, I don't know. Cody, what are your thoughts on it, man? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure everyone has a different experience and a different path in their careers. Uh, one thing that I'm not a huge fan of is gatekeeping. So like someone's like, oh, well, the CEH is a worthless cert. Like if they took anything away from that, that's a positive. Um, I mean, taking the class, I, I've never taken it, so I don't know what's in it. But I mean, if people bash it for being a multiple choice cert and then they hog up a bunch of GX certs, it's like, what, what are you doing? Um, but I mean, if it exposes someone to something, because that's honestly where, where I think um, a lot of people, I guess, would learn from is being exposed to it just like briefly. So I talk about OSINT on my channel and like geospatial intelligence. Like I never did that in the military, but it's a hobby of mine. And I've had people like, I didn't even know I could do that. So just being like exposed to it and, it, and, and then your drive for it takes you down that rabbit hole and then you start meeting people and start learning that way. So yeah, I think I, you, you touched on a lot of good points. It's just being exposed to something and then you like, oh, wow, that's, that's cool. That's my niche right there. And then, you know, they go yeah, at it. Yeah, for sure. I think, and it's weird because I, I talk about passion a lot in a lot of my videos, passion, drive, things like that come up. And for me, it comes up because um, when I was going through my entire career, uh, even up till now, I was always big on research. So before I even got into CEH or Security Plus, I was already researching Backtrack Linux and breaking into wireless networks. Um, I didn't publish anything at the time as far as like blog posts or YouTube videos or anything like that. Granted, this was back in like 04, 05. But, you know, I was I was already doing these things. So by the time I got to my CEH uh, in 2011, I think, no, 14, I think it was, um, I, I met Keytron, and so I was able to take what he taught and his advanced lessons because the way he taught things was, okay, this is what you need to know for the test. Like, here's your exposure to the test, like, and map and this that and a third now here's how you do the job here's here's the advanced like here's a, a malware that i designed that will actually hide these files and do the cleanup work for you and all this other stuff so i was able to get a lot of that advanced knowledge that some people can't do because they went into it trying to learn the entire thing for the certification whereas i look at it as as don't go into a course without ever doing the research don't go into like a CEH boot camp or a CEH course without ever going and saying, all right, let me look into what is enumeration, what is hacking, what is 
offensive security or what is blue teaming, um, what is threat hunting. Um, because if you do that research in advance, then you can actually get started in what you want to do. And one of the things I've told many of the college students that are going through for cybersecurity, do not expect to get out and make a job making or, or get a job making bank if you have done right. nothing. And don't think it's going to be easy if you have done nothing to make a name for yourself. So if you're not on LinkedIn, if you're not writing blog posts, if you're not doing a YouTube channel or have a GitHub or something, something that you can put on a resume or tell a hiring manager, if you want to know about me and what I've done in my free time, because I don't have the experience um, on paper, I now have it on paper. It is digital. You can go to this site and see my blog and the labs I've set up, the boxes I've broken into, whatever the case may be. And that is how you make a name for yourself. And that's not gatekeeping. I had someone tell me I was that was being a gatekeeper. That's not. That's that's making a name because how how can I take your word for it that you know what you know? Yeah, I can ask you questions all day, and you can be sitting there with I don't know whatever in front of you and just answer questions. But if you have actually taken the time to let people know, even if it's not, you may not be sharing it on Twitter or or Facebook or LinkedIn, but you've, you're you writing it as almost like a journal so that when you apply for jobs, you can say, hey, yeah, go to this link. This is who I am. Then, you know, it it lets people know that you're confident in what you do and you're learning because that's what it's all about. This field is is now and always will be about learning. It's continued growth because it's always changing. Some of the malware that worked in the old days still works to this day because people don't want to upgrade. But still, <laughs> the field itself, the technology changes. We now have next generation firewalls. We now have EDR. So we have things like CrowdStrike and Silence that do endpoint detection and response. Not just, you know, I'm going to check a signature. They work based off of, you know, behavioral analysts. So things are always changing and getting better. Yes, Casey, get used to change. We know. We know. <laughs> things change all the time, man. And that's what I love about this field because it's not stagnant. You're not, you don't have to do the same thing over and over again. You can, um, you know, constantly evolve yourself. And that's why I love what I do. And that's why actually I love the new company I'm with because they allow us to do that. Um, you know, so that is one of the biggest things I tell people is if you want to make a name, don't sit there and be like, oh, I got a degree. Here's my resume. I made a name for myself. No, 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 no. Actually go out there and make yourself known because let's be honest the hr system and the resume screenings suck right get to know the hiring managers that's how i got one of my jobs is by knowing the hiring manager well not the hiring manager but the director above the manager and it was he knew me he knew what i could do he knew my experience so it made it easy um you know i have a buddy that got a job at spacex because i told him to talk to the hiring manager so he finally sent him a resume and he was like, why haven't we looked at you? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I looked at him. He got the job. So like, I take pride in that because he was like, should I talk to this guy? Yeah, you should. You really should <laughs> connect with him, introduce yourself. Um, but don't like be like, Hey, I need a job. Right. Connect with them to build a relationship, build a rapport. And it may take a little while cause they're always busy. You know, we're all busy. We all got full-time jobs, but make yourself known. Right. So that's one of the biggest things I have for anybody trying to get into the field is make yourself known. Don't think by being anonymous and hiding your identity, you're going to get a job. Right. Because your only job is going to be bug bounties and illegal stuff. Like, <laughs> let's be honest. Yeah. If you're trying yeah. that hard to hide who you are with what you're doing, it's because you're probably doing some shady shit. <laughs> <laughs> doing something wrong, right? Yeah. Yeah, I like what you yeah. mentioned about doing the uh, – I'm sorry, Casey, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, um, the, the whole thing about, you know, making yourself known online, it's also a good skill because I know, you know, people are mainly focused on their hard skills in InfoSec. You know, I can, you know, pop all these boxes, but I mean, you know, as a pen tester, what's the one thing people hate doing after a pen test? You got to write a report. Reports. So if you can, <laughs> if you can write a blog post and you have, you know, the skills to do that, that reflects that as well. Um, and then it just shows you have a passion. So, I mean, I haven't updated my website in a while, but back when I was brand new into InfoSec, I made sure my website was crisp and it looked good. Um, I had a custom email, so I had, you know, not a Gmail, but it was my email with my name on it. 
And I swear it was probably like one of the first resumes in line because it was just, you know, the email and then the website. Um, so definitely, I mean, whatever you could do, YouTube, I mean, it, it doesn't matter if you, if you feel like you're, and I feel like everyone in InfoSec has, what, what's that called where you, where you feel like you're not good. They talk imposter about all the time. Syndrome. And, imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. I, 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 I talked about it before and I, I swear at least every other week I mention it uh, on this, on Security Happy Hour. Because a lot of people, I've heard people talk about certifications and, and, and downplaying them and saying they don't mean anything. And you're right. To an extent, if you can pass a test, you can pass a test. That's really all it is, right? Even the OSCP. All right, you learn how to pop a few boxes and write a report. Like, it doesn't define your capability as a pen tester because everything is different, right? You're not always going to do the same things. Granted, if you take the course and actually do what it says and learn enumeration, you actually get a lot from it. But regardless, the wall behind me is because I do suffer from imposter syndrome uh, on occasion to where I sit there and I see people, hell, I've been schooled by 17 year olds that are like, oh yeah, I can do all this. And like, I literally watch them do it in a matter of seconds. And I'm like, I'm in the wrong field. Like, and then I turn and look like this and I go, wait a second, I earned this. I busted my ass, I earned this. I do know what I'm doing. Maybe not to that extent, but I'm also did not get into this when I was 15 years old. I didn't get into it until I was in my 20s. So, you know, I take that and I'm like, all right, take a breath, relax, and 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 get back in the right frame of mind. Because I don't care what anybody tells you, we all suffer from it at one point or another. Somebody's gonna school us, and and they may have only been officially in the field. I'm like, oh yeah, I've had this job for a year, and you're like, holy. I'm not. I, I'm just leaving now. I'm, I don't even want to be here. <laughs> but the reality of it is, when you get into it later in life, um, which a lot of people do, you know, because they don't find they really enjoy it until maybe they're in their 20s or you know they're in their 30s or 40s, whatever the case may be. Hell, if you're my dad, I think he was 40 some or 50 years old, um, you know, before he finally got into security. But still, he has that understanding of it to where. Granted, he does GRC, so the, the technical aspect doesn't really affect him as much. But I think we all suffer from it at one point or another where we're like, holy shit, I'm, I'm doing the wrong thing. I mean, these days it's more people that do the illegal shit get paid more than me. But, hey, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I mean, other than that, I, I just, I think... I think there's a lot of growth that we can have in this field, though. And uh, you mentioned gatekeeping. And, and um, I always talk about gatekeeping and elitism and because I, I despise both of them. If you think you're better than somebody because you have a bug bounty or numerous bug bounties or you have CVEs to your name, good on you. Not everybody is going to go out there and look for bugs. Not everybody is going to go out there and try to find the exploits or, or do find vulnerabilities. They're out there to better companies all right so that is where they concentrate their time on okay this is what's readily available so i'm going to go out there and i'm going to protect this company from what is known right now in the field um you know some of people have families so they can't take the time because let's be honest doing finding zero days and finding bug bounties and things like that takes a lot of time and it takes time away from families and how my wife probably wants to kill me most days because of how much time I spend either writing my book or behind a computer, you know, in general. So it does, this field eats up a lot of our time. So when you get involved in those things, it eats up even more time because you're not guaranteed money always. So you have to work a full-time job plus do bug bounties, plus try to get to some of these conferences where you can make even more money. So it's, it's really rough at times to do things like that. I think you kind of nailed something on the head and that comes from, you know, the, just back into the military perspective is, you know, there's a commitment to this, you know, and at 40 years of age, 41, leaving a 15 year career in law enforcement, I was four years away from retirement and dropping it to come into the cybersecurity. Um, you know, to me, I'm fulfilling a dream. I'm doing, going to the next level in my life to open a new chapter and go. Um, but there's a commitment to that. You know, there's a huge commitment. I think a lot of times, you know, a lot of people, because there's getting into this or whether you've already just started off or you're still trying to get in, there's a lot of people that are having commitment issues to it because, well, where do I commit to? You know, again, you go to law enforcement, you say, man, I want to be a, 
I'll be a, it's because it's an easy topic to talk about. I want to be a, a canine. I want to handle a dog or I want to be a detective. Okay, well, go be a cop, graduate the police academy, go work the road for a couple of years, learn yourself, your skill, take a couple of cool classes, and then boom, you got that position. Where in cybersecurity, I would talk to people. And I remember I went to a, uh, a cyber symposium. It was my first one. It was like really kind of that tossed into the deep end uh, uh, experience. And I'm sitting there talking with a bunch of like high end people that, you know, run, you know, you know, run their own socks or, you know, or, or you know, uh, uh, VPs of security guys have been in the business 20 years, CISOs and stuff. And I was talking, and I met this lady who was affiliated with the school. She was a, a, a dean and she was like, Oh, you know, you know, so tell me, what do you want to do with cybersecurity? What do you want to do? And I was like, uh, IT security. What do I, cause I don't, you know, what do you do? I want to do IT security. You know, I didn't know red team. I didn't know purple team, purple team to me. I'm like, what the hell is purple team? Uh, is that where your toes kind of start to fall apart? Um, so <clears throat> to learn all that stuff again and try to find that path, you know, there's a commitment to that. And then everything that you said, um, it's spot on. I'm with you. I just think that I like seeing some of the younger guys, younger, again, just cause my, my arena, a lot of younger veterans that have reached out to me that I try to mentor and they're like, well, what do I, what do I want to do? Well, unfortunately you got to dive in a little bit and kind of start tasting things and see what, see what you like. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's the big thing. Like I said, man, I, it's funny cause when you're going and you're looking at the blue team side of things and you're, uh, there's not a, there's more training coming around now, but even when I got into the field, there's, there wasn't a lot of training. It was learn Linux, learn, uh, breaking into things, learn Wi-Fi networks, learn this that, and a third, which I did. I loved breaking into Wi-Fi networks. That's how I got started was breaking into my own Wi-Fi network. And then a few WPS networks, whenever that came around, that was fun. Took about 10 seconds, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was, it was doing all these things. And then even in the Army, a lot of the training through SANS, even though it was defensive, they taught you the offensive tools, right? So you learned, you know, Kali Linux and breaking into things. And, you know, of course, the first exploit anybody ever teaches you anytime you take a security class is MS8, MS08067. Um, and, and that's like the first exploit. They'll like bring out an old Windows box and be like, oh, yeah, run this. And you immediately get root and you're like, or system and you're like. I swear I've done this in every class I've been in. <laughs> like, can we get something up to date, please? But the fact is, it still works. There, there's still people out there running that, that operating system, so it still works. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I everything was taught offensively. So when people want to learn threat hunting, when they want to learn blue team style things, like how to recognize phishing, how to do log correlation, how to learn SIM, how to learn EDRs, there's not a lot of training out there. So getting those jobs, and that's why I find it hard to get those jobs for a lot of analysts and for a lot of people, because how can you say you have experience doing something that there's limited to no training for? And again, there's more coming out now, but even still, they're like, hey, you need experience with ArcSight or CrowdStrike or any of these technologies. And you're like, I'm just trying to get in the field. Like, how can I get right. training on something that, I can't even do it's not open source it's not like i can go out there and be like oh yeah i'm gonna stand up an arc site server and i'm gonna be good no <laughs> it does not work that way <laughs> right. no doubt what you got cody yeah well i was gonna say you mentioned like there's not a lot of training or like it's not really talked about much as like the blue team stuff like i i am day in day out vulnerability management like if you ask any hacker what that means they're like what the the fuck is vulnerability management and um it's it it's kind of what i like i'm trying to fill the gap in like with my youtube channel is trying to introduce things like there's things that people don't talk about so we mentioned earlier like the job descriptions on online for like entry-level positions are just ridiculous well who's like assisting with that on the security side so like having like good security recruiters and i we kind of mentioned about this in my in my channel with a husky hack so like all these different positions that aren't really being filled in that well as far as like recruiters go um management grc and all of that um but yeah i i think the, the like you said earlier like red team super sexy and you know blue team kind of just gets like oh well th those those are the positions that are open on, on the team as well so yeah <laughs> and and you talked about the job the job position thing came up again i've seen a lot of things actually uh, ISC squared came out and denounced what a lot of people were saying because they were like, 
people are putting out that CISP is this certification for like two years on the field or whatever the case. And ISC Squared actually came out and was like, uh, no. Like, that is not <laughs> a junior level that. cert. Um, you need to take that off your list. No. <laughs> and and that's because I've always wondered and, and never being in the position of a hiring manager, I don't, I don't know how these job descriptions get put out. So unless you're with a consulting company that actually has been in the field, the owners are in the field, the owners have done the job, um, so everybody in that chain knows how these job descriptions are supposed to look. Whereas when you're looking at these companies, that that's not how they're set up. It makes it very difficult because they do. They get these general, they go out and look for whatever is the new fancy certification. They're like, oh, we want, well, CISP says security. We want that one. Um, let's put GAC on there. And that, I've always despised that when they put GAC <laughs> certification. I'm like, well, which one? Right. Like there's like 30 of them. Which one do you want? Let's let's be honest here. Um, you know, and I see all these things. And I'm like, uh, in order to have an actual official CISP, you have to have, I think it's five years of experience mm -hmm. in the field. So, um, or degree, I think. Yeah. You're, you're looking for a junior level analyst with five years of experience in security. Mm. <laughs> like, what are you doing here, guy? Um, so I see things like that. And it's frustrating. So how, and, and I think I talked about it on another security happy hour. So somebody, if you've seen any of them and are in the chat, go ahead and, and, you know, mention it. Um, but we talked, I, I believe I talked about it a few weeks ago and it's like, how do we change the mindset? How do we affect change in these companies and with the hiring managers, with the CIS, the, the CISOs and, you know, the security directors and, and everybody else that for some reason, if it's not them putting out the job descriptions, why not? Why is it not them, the, the person that is going to hire the position, putting out the job description? And if they are, why do we have people in those positions that apparently don't know the field? If they're in a security position, you should know the field. I don't care if you got a degree in basket weaving. If you're a CISO or a security director, you should be doing your research in the field so that you know who you are managing. And that's my issue. Yeah, I fully agree. And I think I saw like a, an example, like someone invented some program, programming language. It's not specific to security, but I see, he, I like, ma he like invented it like three years ago. I was like, must have 10 years experience. He's like, oh, funny. <laughs> Just created that three years ago. I've I, I seen that on, I, I seen it on LinkedIn. I seen it on Twitter and I seen it on Facebook, the same exact post <laughs> where the guy that invented like Swift or something and it said needs like six plus or seven plus years of experience. And he goes, I invented it. And it was like three years ago. So <laughs> sure, I have six plus. <laughs> right. He's like, How is this even possible? So, and that's what blows my mind, seeing things like that. And so I, I want to better the community. And that's always been a big thing. I want to better the community for those breaking in because it is so difficult because we do have gatekeepers. We do have elitism which makes it hard to find your way because sometimes those are the people you run into in the way they talk. And there's a lot of them that are like, oh, you don't have a CVE to your name, you don't belong here. You don't have a bug bounty, you don't belong here. And, and it's like, well, I'm a threat hunter. I'm not doing CVEs or bug bounties, so what's it even matter? And so it pushes them out of the field. But on top of that, we also have the people that are putting out job descriptions they're like, hey, you need 20 years of experience in a technology that's only been out three years. Like, come on now. I, I, I just get frustrated because we're trying to, we're trying to not only change the culture within these companies to make security in their mindset, right? It, that has to be, you know, in the front of their minds. But now we also have to make it to where you know what you're hiring and you should not be in that position because it should be the hiring manager putting out a job description and the hiring manager should have an understanding of security they may not have the technical know-how right so they don't have to be able to be hands-on and you know configuring firewalls or you know looking through logs but they have to have the oversight and the knowledge to know okay what certifications are relevant what experience is relevant and what degrees are relevant because how are you going to ask a junior analyst to have a master's degree how are you going to have a consultant with a PhD? Don't get me wrong, it'd be great. But at the same time, PhD, nine times out of 10, is a lot of theory. 
So what are they consulting on? Because if you're going to hire them as a consultant to do blue team or red team, I'd really like to know in all their studies how much of theirs has been hands-on at this point. Because you're writing papers. Even at a master's degree level, all of my classes were writing papers. That's why I quit my master's. I got tired of writing papers for every class. Like, I should be doing forensics on a hard drive or breaking into a lab, whatever the case may be. I should not be writing a paper about how you do these things. I should have the hands-on training. And so I was like, I, I, this is pointless. I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, but it's one of those things like, how do we, how do we change that mindset? How do we, do we just have to just basically go company by company and hope somebody sees the information that those in the field are actually putting out? Like, is that really our only option at this point? You know, and it's it's funny you bring it up, and this is on the outside looking in and just seeing things just from a you know my experience and my perspective. But it seems like the word security is nothing more than um, than business. Um, there's not a true uh, value to a security element within a business. And like I said again, I'm I'm shooting from left field, you know, pee wee football. I'm not you know college level, um, but. You know, it seems like there's so much of an argument with security not getting the budget they need to do things they need to get the equipment they need to get the training they need the you know the pour in again taking care of your people and taking care of, of your enterprise or your business your assets um, and so I I feel like looking at things you know in my mind the people who are at the top of the list at the top of the food chain who may not be directly involved with security or have any idea or aspect of IT. Um, you know, your, your, your uh, CEOs and stuff and all that, and even people just slightly between them, uh, they don't value that. They don't look at that and say like, look, get me a, a young man that's been, you know, putting his feet on the ground. It's going to come into work and put his 40 hours in and put a, you know, do a lot of work to better himself and invest himself into the company because he believes in that. He believes in that, that posture. He believes in making things better here. They want the, well, again, I want the, you know, the, the two-year analyst that's a, that's a CISO bring him in and let him do it. And we're going to pay him an analyst pay instead of paying him what he rightfully deserves, he or she, excuse me, rightfully deserves uh, as a CISO, which is obviously a, a very much well-respected position within, you know, the, uh, uh, the food chain. And I think that, you know, kind of looking at and putting all that together, the, the, the thought process, the budget, the, um, the um, uh, basically the redheaded stepchild of, you know, corporations, at least on that bigger aspect, I feel like sometimes there's not going to be, a tremendous amount of change. There's always going to be a back and forth because nobody wants to take that. I would rather, you know, as a, as a businessman, I would think of it and say, well, I would rather just hire that one guy and put everything on him and we'll buy insurance and the insurance will take care of it. That will just, we'll just, we'll avoid it all costs of the insurance on it and let it sit. So I'm going to let Cody give his two cents. Wait, he's on this side of my screen over here. <laughs> I'm going to let Cody give his two cents real quick because I have a lot of uh, comments to make on that. So I'll let him go first. Yeah, I like some places they like you said, like they, they'd hire someone that's like a CISO level and pay them an analyst level. I mean, I, I was talking with a uh, with a uh, oh god, I'm having a brain fart right now. Uh, Derek, De is it Derek? It's I Derek, you're right. Cyber Derek, Warrior I, works too, I was but thinking, Derek is I was fine. thinking Pittsburgh, I was thinking your old handle Pittsburgh. I was like, SCS oh, I Pittsburgh, yeah, us. yeah, yeah, <laughs> and uh. I mean, I was telling before, like I, I was at a larger Fortune 500 company. And mind you, I was I, I came into the position brand new, and then I kind of grew through the years, found my niche, and I would see people like come in with more years of experience with me, and, or more experience than me, and then they get paid the same amount. I mean, I know you're not supposed to talk about that stuff when you're working, but I mean, if you're just grabbing a beer and all that, it's like. But it's like, wow, oh, some of these companies are really cheap on some of this stuff. And then like I get into meetings where they talk about like bug bounties and like how much they should pay and all that. And it's like, well, what's the what's the best way we can, you know, why, why don't we just hire them and just pay them like a salary of 60,000 bucks a year or something like that versus, you know, paying a $10,000 bug or something like that. So businesses are always looking for ways to cut costs. And it's unfortunate that, you know, InfoSec, it, it's a cost center in pretty much every business, unless your business is security so they're always looking for ways to, to cut costs anywhere they can so if that's underpaying well-qualified people then that's probably what it's going to be yeah so i've been a consultant for the company i'm with now and my last company 
And you're not wrong. I see a lot of check the box, right? So even in the military, we all three of us have experience with that, where the inspections come and do, what are we going to do? Everything we can to just check the box. All right, yeah, we've been doing that for, for three years now. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, it's all good. I see companies do it all the time. Even with all the regulations out there, PCI, high trust, um, God knows however many else, socks and everything else out there. Um, you know, th they they want to check the box and be like, oh yeah, we've got a pen test. Meanwhile, they paid for like a four grand vulnerability assessment. Like, it's not a freaking <laughs> pen test. So, <coughs> it it ends up being, you see that aspect of things. And then you see companies where I think what burns security. So a lot of companies don't want to invest in anything until they get breached or until they know they've been breached rather. So unfortunately, what I think has ruined the ability for security teams is insurance. Because what a company will do yeah. is go out there and I think we've, I had a buddy do some research one time and it was like, you could pay, I think five grand a year and get, I think like half a million dollars in cyber insurance. And it was like, are you kidding me right now? Five grand a wow. year and you're offering half a mil. You realize that company's probably already been breached and you're only charging five grand. So well, one of two things well, needs to happen. They either need to get rid of insurance completely like that. That entire aspect should disappear. I don't care. I normally care about people's jobs, but when it comes to that, that hurts security because it by hurting security, you're hurting the people. You truly are. You're hurting the workers and the clients. So I think insurance needs to disappear in terms of cyber insurance be, or they need to up the cost. So you either need to make the cost, you're either paying per year for, or, or I'd even say 80% of what your insurance is for is what you should pay per year or it's gone because I, it's, it's hurting, not just, it's hurting everybody. Like people, yeah, they just right. write it off. They're just like, Oh, I pay insurance. So uh, I'm only going to put a yeah. hundred grand into security this year. And that's for my, you know, one employee salary and the, the upkeep of the hardware. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know what it takes to get cyber insurance. I'm, I'm on the other side of it. I'm providing those services, but I, I don't know if it requires like, you know, if I was an insurance company, it'd behoove me to know, like, like, is this company like Equifax? Like, do they have vulnerable Apache? Str like, why the hell would I insure that? Like, it's the same thing with car insurance. Like you're insuring a, you know, let's say a Lamborghini and that thing, you know, the wheels are falling off of the damn thing. Like, I want to insure that. Like, I, 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 I wish I knew, so I'm not going to speak too much on it, but I mean, I, I think there is a place for insurance as far as like, you know, some bad shit happens sometimes. Some, I mean, really good security teams, they get blindsided on something, you know, for X, Y, Z reason and working in vuln management. Um, one of the things that we aim for is not 100% compliance. Um, it's 100 or compliance as far as patching, because it's, it, it's a pipe dream for that to happen, especially in an enterprise. But there's some teams where it's like they they have to balance out like availability and security and all of that. Cause that, like I mentioned earlier, it's the, the, the company only cares about making a profit. And if a security patch requires rebooting servers, they're probably going to want to delay that. And unfortunately, if that delay, there's that like little Delta period where they get breached, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, if I was to be an insure, an insurance provider, it, it's like, I want full credentialed scans of your network. I want to have asset management, all of this stuff. You know, if you got PCI, make sure that you're compliant on that. And, you know, I'll insure you, but like, like you said, it, it's killing jobs that people are like, Oh, we checked the box, you know, spent 10,000 bucks for, we're clear on security. So yeah, that's well, and, it. go ahead, Dennis. No, I was just going to say, I, um, in my previous, uh, my previous career, my previous job, I was working with my, uh, employer, which is, um, a city government on, uh, infrastructure and stuff. So I got into, um, like SAT stuff. So I was doing like security awareness training for all the employees at the city, uh, police, fire, uh, city management stuff, just to kind of go over, I mean, the big time back in 2018, 2019 was all the talk about Atlanta and all these other cities getting uh, getting ransomware and getting stuck on, you know, four, 500, 600, yeah, get, get hammered. Um, and we started looking at that and started talking about, like, you know, implementing uh, phishing through, like, like no before and, and doing these extra different little steps that, you know, even though 
I was doing my voodoo as a detective and cyber crimes and, and, and homicides and all stuff, I was willing to put that extra time in to help to do that. And the first words out of the, you know, the city managers, not the person making the decisions was, was what about cyber insurance? I want to know about cyber insurance. Give me, you know, so I was like, you know, focus, woo saw, go back and, and do some research on it. And yeah, right. And get yourself, you know, get myself some information to go back with the IT guy and be like, listen, everything we see about cyber, cyber security insurance is, you know, they may cover you most likely, but the reality is, is you're not going to get a claim paid if, um, Malfeasance. They can find a reason to fault you just like any other insurance, you know, mm-hmm. you know, you get these like shady second and third rate insurance companies on your car. And you're like, oh, I got insurance. I'm covered. Well, you go have an accident. You're like, hey, pay me out. I'm like, ah, ooh, you're out of blinker fluid. So we can't help you. On that. You know, you're, <laughs> you're done. And, uh, you know, that crap happens. And, and, and you know, back on the, uh, the, the communications with my, my previous employer talking to him, uh, one of the things that stood out in all my investigations was um, – coming from the law enforcement side, the FBI, don't pay ransomware. You're stupid for doing it. Don't pay ransomware. You know what? Spend the money on doing your backups and doing everything you need to do to do your ABCs and build your strength, your, your, your posture. And again, to piggyback off Cody, clear, it's, you know, people just want to tick a box and go. And even if it comes to getting, uh, you know, to be federated or whatever, so they can work with the government, they just you know, click, okay, don't worry about it no more. Go over here. You know, we're yeah. going to spend money on this advertisement and look, look pretty doing it, you know? For sure. And it's it's funny you say that because when you look at things and you talk about don't pay ransomware, and that's always been my big thing, even before, so it only became popular, I'd say probably within the past two or three months where I've seen articles about, oh, even if you pay ransomware, they're, they're holding your data or they're doing this, that, and a third. From the, the very first article <laughs> I ever saw about ransomware, my first thought was, you are re- you are stupid if you pay that. I was like, because all they're going to do is, yeah, they may release your files. May. They may give you that decryption key. And I'm like, oh, okay, here you go. But guess what? They still have your data. They probably exfiltrated all your data before they encrypted it anyways. And on top of that, Unless you're smart enough to know, unless you're smart enough to like hire somebody to get rid of all of the ransomware that was already there or the droppers and payloads that were already there, even if they release it, they're still going to be there. So guess what? A month down the line, they're going to be like, "Ah, you're popped again. Here you go. Right. And so you you see these things and I'm just like, dude, paying this is the dumbest thing you can do. And I've been saying that since day one. And I just look at it and I'm like, all these companies that were like, oh, we got to pay. Hospitals. And, and that's blown my mind recently that, again, I, I got called naive, and I'm, I probably am, because I did. I thought for a while, even like black hats, even your, your cyber criminals had that line they would not cross of like hospitals. Like hospitals were off limits because you'd kill a ton of people. And to see how many hospitals within the past two months, I think it was, that have been popped with ransomware is just mind-boggling. Because let's be honest – Education, so your your colleges and high schools and stuff, and then your hospitals probably have the worst security, hands down. Hands yeah. down, those two industries have the worst security. Yeah, and and I'll I'll say like coming from a vuln management perspective, what what they're looking to do, and uh, is they're just scanning the internet and whatever is like the lowest hanging fruit. It's like I don't care if you're a hot like, and I'm thinking like a black hat. So like you mentioned earlier, like paying the ransom and all that. It's like okay, yeah, you can pay me in Bitcoin or whatever, and I'm still going to sell your data and make more money, so might as well. <laughs> yeah. That's the way right. I would do it. And that's it. how all the – and look at it, all the ransoms, except for maybe a few. Generally speaking, when you're looking at these companies, they're huge companies, like a, a lot of them. Like when you're taking cities and governments and things like that, they're huge, but they're like, oh, pay me 20 grand and I'll, I'll go away. It's because they don't care about your Bitcoin. They already got your data, so you can sit there and, and come from backup. Guess what? By the time that ransomware is there, they have all of your decrypted files on their system. Or maybe they took the encrypted files also, copied them all, but they have the decryption key anyway, so they're still going to get your data. They still have it all. Right. Right. And I mean, the people doing this, they're in it for the money, so you might as well maximize the profit where you can. So it's like, yeah, we'll give you the de- decryption key. You can decrypt it. I'm still going to sell it on my shady.onion site mm-hmm. <laughs> as well. So. 
Yeah. And that's, and it's, that's the, the, the crazy thing you think about hospitals having such poor security and uh, paying ransomware if it comes up. But I mean, I'm sitting there thinking to myself is if I was a patient under HIPAA alone, if my data was compromised and you paid it, it's like, Hey, I paid it. It's cool. I would be finding the the biggest, nastiest, most shiestiest attorney in the world. And I'd be like, listen, <laughs> it's no long, it's no longer general hospital. It's a dentist hospital. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm having my own bedpan service cause I'm not playing with the, you know, and, and that's, that's what I, but, it, and it's funny because that's where I like, I look at things and people always talk about it. So like I, I, I it, during cyber awareness month, I, I, I did a video and I said, look, our data is already out there. Marine, mm-hmm. reservist, Air Force and Army, um, OPM got breached. If you have a security clearance or had a security clearance, guess what? Years ago, your data's gone. Goodbye. Socials, yep. addresses, everything. They took your entire SF-86. Gone. So when I look at things and how many companies have been breached since I was, I don't know, 18, um, and then Facebook, you before we even realized about privacy, a lot of us, we were all like, oh, yeah, I'm here, I'm there, this is my dog, this is my cat, this is... Blah, blah, blah. It's out there for the world. So everybody already has your information. Right. So for me, I look at it. And yes, to this day, if a company gets breached and it's my data, I'm going to get pissed. But not because they got breached. I'll get pissed if they didn't do their due diligence to secure themselves. So I know as somebody in security, nothing is 100%. Nothing is guaranteed. Unless you have that computer unplugged six feet underground in a concrete lead line box, guess what? It's probably going to get breached. The moment you put, plug it into the internet, it's gone. So I have this thing where I don't care so much about my data. More so, did you do your due diligence to secure it? Because if you did, then all right, I don't have a problem with that. But when I know you're not patching systems, when you have Windows XP computers out there, and, and the reason hospitals, I, I hold hospitals accountable is, I don't think it's necessarily them. I think it's their third parties, right? Because right. let's be honest, they don't develop their software that they use in-house. They, right. they uh, Third parties develop it for them. They bring it in. And then it's a lot like the army or, or the military in general. You have to wait for your gold disc to update this system. Um, and it, it only happens quarterly, which means... You have that three-month time span, and guess what? That disc probably was made in the beginning of the quarter, maybe in that second month, which means now you're missing another two months of patches. So you're not even getting updated all the time. So hospitals still have that problem. And then they have the problem of, oh, the software for my X-ray machine or for my MRI machine or my EKG machine only runs on Windows XP or Windows ME or, or whatever the case may be. So you have these issues, and if we don't, you know, they can't address them, the hospital themselves, because it's like, yeah, we can go out there and try to pay a new company, but now they have to pay a new company to design the software on a new operating system, and hopefully it's maintained more frequently than every quarter or every three years. And on top of that, they got to get it for a decent amount of money that's not going to bankrupt them to install it on all of their systems in the entire, you know, region. Because look at UPMC alone. If you look at U- University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, PA, Ohio, and I think West Virginia, all have UPMC hospitals. Right. Which it's means one of the now largest you're looking networks, at, yeah. you know, probably a few million dollars. And don't get me wrong, they make bank off of their insurance and everything else. But still, those guys don't, I don't blame, a, I don't blame companies for wanting to maintain their bottom line. I blame some of these third parties that rape the shit out of them for money because it's a hospital. Like give them what they need. It's the same way I look at the military because the military gets, the government gets raped on everything. You can have a $600 or a $400 HP computer and somebody's still going to sell it to them for a thousand dollars and be like, Oh yeah, here you go. Thousand dollars a machine. And you're like, really? I could buy this in the store for 600. And the government's still gonna be like, lowest bidder. That's who we're going with. Cost of a grand a computer, I could build that for two hundred. Like, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> but you see the same thing with hospitals. The companies that need these things, they upsell the shit out of them. And yeah, how look at the PS Five. You had a bunch of bots go out there, buy the ones from Walmart, and they're selling them for two grand right now. Like, <laughs> that's yeah. supply but, and demand, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Screw that. You know what? Wait till after Christmas when I can go buy it in the store myself without an issue. Then we'll right. talk. 
you can sit on your two thousand dollars, your your hundred and some thousand dollars you spent on PS fives. Go ahead, you you could spend that money and sit on it because I'm not buying it. Right. Unfortunately, there's a bunch of rich people out there that probably will. But, there's, a bunch of, there's a bunch of everybody's man. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> some people maxing out some credit cards. Right. You're saving my password in the raw, man. I've seen a lot of companies get breached recently that were doing that. Yeah, yeah. Go on GitHub. They'll put they'll put their uh, SSH creds. I mean, I got a bug bounty for uh, plain text credentials. Just like username equals password equals, and a lot of. I mean, it, it, it's usually a high rated or critical vuln, or they rate it as a critical or P one or whatever. If it's like production stuff, but yeah, companies do some stupid stuff and. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we we've talked about that. I talked about that today actually, um, at work, and we were talking about like open source and some of our projects, um, you know, just to, for for availability's sake and you know getting, you know, those that do scripting and programming and things like that, getting their feedback to maybe make it more efficient and clean up the code and stuff. And my statement was then, as it will to everything, as long as it is sanitized, I don't want any private information, whether it be credentials or client information, whatever the case may be getting out there as long as it's sanitized so as long as it works without needing our creds or our cloud infra then i'm good go ahead open source the shit out of it because guess what there are people out there that know more than us guaranteed there are people out there that don't have a life that know more than us (laughs) so i i have no problem with that but you know you see some of these companies are like oh yeah we're gonna put all this on github and we're not going to make it private. It's going to be public. And here's the SSH credentials into our domain controller. <laughs> what? <laughs> Did that really just happen? Did they really just do that? <clears throat> they just want it running and don't even think Rand isn't really Rand. Random is never random. There's no such thing as random. Yeah. To your point earlier about like hospitals, that's the one thing like working in vuln management is like some 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 systems cannot be patched because yep. availability hospitals like they got to keep people alive. The last thing they care about is patch Tuesday. Yep. Uh, so the the one thing we can do that um, instead of like keeping software and all of that upgraded because like you said you get this disk and you upload <laughs> you update your Windows machines like every quarter or whatever is build controls around that so. If that means like keeping, I, I, I don't work in healthcare at all. So I'm just uh, <laughs> like either. a, like a life, life preserver, like the feeding tube and all that stuff. I, I'm, I, if you could build controls around that air gap, it, you know, all of that stuff that should <clears throat> for the most part be sufficient versus patching. Cause if, if you put something like on a network, you can do lateral movement and all, all sorts of stuff you can do with that. So my, my um, thing for it has always been. You should have two networks, just like you do for a lot of other things. You should have two networks. You should have the hospital network that operates the PII. Like, and I know it sucks because it requires a closed system and a lot more cabling and a lot more networking and things like that. But with the cloud, it should be a little bit easier. But basically, you limit your internet access to only the hospital network um, and its subsequent third parties. And then you have another computer or another network where they can access internet, email, and everything else. Because then your um, patient information, your your capability to run your actual hospital is on one. And then you don't even tie them in. There should be no way to get from an email network, like a personal network, to the hospital mm-hmm. network. It should be completely yeah. segregated. I'm talking different routers, switches, everything. Nothing should connect anywhere in there. And that is the only way I could see it being... Okay, you can go on Facebook. Okay, you can check your personal email. You can be a normal human during the workday um, is by doing that. And it's unfortunate. It's going to, it takes a lot of infrastructure. Although I think now with some of the private cloud infrastructure and things like that, that you can do, um, it makes it a little bit easier and a little bit more financial, um, uh, a little easier financially, but it, it still would be a lot of legwork right now to implement that because we've had these one networks tied in over the internet to where, okay, I have to hit this HIPAA server or whatever way back here for insurance information and this, that, and the third. But if we, if we made anything that is high trust or or HIPAA related on one network, 
we've done it. <laughs> there's there's networks out there that are just literally you can only talk in that network. You can't get to the internet. You use the internet, but you can't get to the internet. Then I think it's it's more reasonable. But again, that requires a huge change in infrastructure for all of the yeah. medical systems. Yeah. And it's a pipe dream. And I, I'm sure like most of these hospitals, they don't even have a budget for like an on-prem security person. So if they don't even have someone barking at them, like this is the best security practice. Then I mean, they're, they don't know any better and I can't blame them. Like I, no. I, I'm all against blaming the end user. It's our job to, well, educate. If, if they don't hire, care. educate. If they don't even have anyone to educate them, then I don't, <laughs> it's kind of like a paradox. Um, yeah, not, I, I think I th I'm, I'm trying to think of like an example of like just like an obscure data breach. I think it was like Target, like it was like an online. It was, third, it was their HVAC system, the HVAC, HVAC third HVAC party system. that actually caused the Target breach. Oh, God. <laughs> and I was going to just kind of bounce off that real quick. The, you know, the hospital uh, syndrome that you have is that, you know, the hospitals, most of these hospitals and I've been to UMPC, so I, I or UPMC. Yeah. Yeah. University of Pittsburgh. I've been there, uh, had family there uh, recently for a couple of different um, stuff, but their IOT is ridiculous. Could you imagine being in charge of that and just realizing, I mean, and when I say IOT, I don't mean, you know, the standard IOT stuff. I mean, a lot of their critical devices uh, within the ER run on yeah. IOT. And that is, to me, that is like opening red flags and huge security issues because you can't secure that. You can't do that. But the other thing to kind of consider is too, um, and in 2020, I think they estimated like 62 to 65 different major hospital networks in the United States have been hit with ransomware. Yep. I would be interested to know, and I think I got, an, I think I know the answer, but I'd be interested to know how many of those were done by network penetration. I think that probably 99.99% of them were done by phishing, by email, end user. And again, I'm with you. I don't blame the end user, but the end user does have a due diligence responsibility. You to should not, uh, how do I put this? A, some hospitals, and I know because I got pissed, I think one of them was the military. Some hospitals are set up, you cannot access personal email. Hell, some mm -hmm. hospitals are set up with no email at all unless you're at the executive level. Like, unless you're in, like, the business offices, your mm -hmm. nurses, your your doctors, they have no access to email. They don't have a, a company email mention, address. They, they don't have that. anything. Yeah. So there's no way to get records. And, it, and it, initially, it pissed me off. It, it did. Whenever I was like, hey, I can just email you this. And they're like, we don't have email. No, you can't. Bullshit, everybody has email. No, we really don't. Like, it, it didn't click at first. But, yeah, I, uh, you would send a show to him, Link. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. All right, yeah, hold up. I, I... Wait, for everybody in the chat, hold up. Let me send this. I'm going I'm to copy this, and we're going to put it in the YouTube chat. That way people can get to it. Um, Good old show, Dan. So, I, uh... I get it now though. Like it, it, I was angry at first because I was trying to do something with my records and it was more ease of use for me. And Dennis, I lost your camera. Yeah, I know. I, some stupid thing happened there. I'm back. So it was more easy use for me, but I understand it now. Um, a hundred percent. Do not click that link. KC Becking. <laughs> <laughs> it's showed in. It's okay. Um, <laughs> I'll click it. You want to see? I'll click it later. Um, <laughs> But it's, um, yeah, I, I get it now. I, I, after really thinking about it, after calming down because I was just trying to make something easy on myself, I get it. You know, not having email on a hospital network makes sense. You know, if you're at that business and executive level, if you're at the office worker level, cool. Um, you should because you need to communicate with the business structure. But mm -hmm. at that, the nurses stations, at the, you know, receptionist or whatever the case may be. I understand. It, it makes a lot more sense now, especially with ransomware and things like that. Um, but yeah, phishing is still going to be the way they get in. So these hospitals that allow this personal use or allow the email to come in from mm -hmm. anything other than other hospitals, then you're going to get caught eventually. Yeah. Because even us, I'll be honest, there's even security professionals and IT professionals that get caught by <laughs> ransomware. That's how they get in and get immediate domain admin because they yep. popped... Some company did not have segregation of privileges, so some jackass was logged in as an admin and opened his email and was like, oh, man, I get a gift card? Yeah, sure, I'll go there. 
Yeah. What? <laughs> Pre previous employer that 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 happened on an internal pen test, and we forever called the guy that got caught up with the phishing email. We called him Analyst B. So <laughs> that was stuck with him for the entire time he was there. Analyst B. Yeah. Um, but like you said, it, it's it's like the same thing with having a security clearance. It's um like it, instead of need to know, it's need to have. Like, does a nurse need to have an email address? Yeah. I, maybe if their job requires it sure if their job doesn't then no they don't need one like yep and that goes back to uh again i did for cyber awareness month somebody put up you know only keep what you need and is it same thing if you're not using an account anymore you don't need it delete it remove it you know even if that company keeps it on their servers for which we know facebook will keep all your data for life um, regardless of what they say, Twitter's the same way and Google and everybody else. But if you don't actually need the email, delete it. If you don't need the Facebook account, delete it. If you don't need the account for Lord knows what other sites you're accessing, delete them. Or you better be using fake credentials that really don't matter anyways and all fake information. But saying that, we are well past our hour and... <laughs> Got to come to an end, unfortunately. Uh, I got some things to do in the morning. This is so, the it has been a pleasure <laughs> having all of you here. Look, guys, if you don't know, go ahead, hit that subscribe, hit that like button. Down there in the description is actually the contact information for LinkedIn for Cody and Dennis. You can also find Cody's Twitter handle down there. Um, Cody, I know I'm subscribed to your YouTube channel, but if you want to send it to me in chat, I'll throw it in the description yeah, after this. Yeah, real quick. Um, and honestly, all the ways you can support me. Look, guys, I love doing this for you. I'm going to do it regardless. I'm going to keep doing security happy hour and videos and all that other fun stuff. But mm -hmm. I, um, I do. I really appreciate all the support, whether it's shares of videos, likes, comments. Um, I do have a GoFundMe because me and my wife are trying to make more merchandise. Um, this hoodie was made by my wife. It is up on my site, uh, cyberwarriorstudios.com. Uh, so I do take custom orders and then, um, I'm trying to make a lot more. I've got to go find me for that. I've got buy me a beer Well, let's buy me a coffee, but you know, I drink <laughs> beer. So buy me a beer, um, Patreon. If you want to become a patron, it, that'd be phenomenal. Um, and then there's also some other YouTube channels you can follow down in the description. So go ahead, check us out. Follow me. Um, get on discord. I'm also on Twitter, LinkedIn. Facebook, you name it. You can find me, find Cody, find Dennis. This has been an awesome time having you all here this evening on Security Happy Hour, and I will catch you all next time.